I think it's one of the coolest terms. If you want to impress your non-photography friends, uh, just mention the word hyperfocal distance, and they're gonna they're gonna be really impressed with how much you know. Just the fact that you know these complicated words. And so, let's talk a little bit about how you set the hyperfocal distance, what it is, and why it's important. So, it is the focusing distance to achieve the maximum depth of field, which is another way of saying if you want as much in focus, this is where you set your focus point in order to get as much in focus for a particular photograph. This is notably particularly important to a landscape photographer, uh, possibly an architectural photographer, somebody who has a scene with everything in focus and they want everything to be in focus in front of them. So let's go back through coming up with some of our photography basics. We know that when we focus on a subject, uh, depth of field will extend and kind of peter out after a little bit. And so we have a limited range of depth of field. When you focus up close, it's a pretty shallow depth of field. And when you focus far away, it's a much greater depth of field of range from the beginning to the end. And somewhere in between the near and the far is your hyperfocal distance, this little magical mystery point where if you set your lens to that particular point, set a particular aperture, you will get everything from the foreground to the background into an acceptably sharp photograph. And the key is, well, how do we do that? Well, first off, let's think about times where we don't need to do it. And the first is when you have distant subjects. Now, this Bhutan monastery is much closer than the mountains or the clouds in the background, but relatively speaking, photographically speaking, it's all pretty far away. And we don't need to worry about hyperfocal distances with far away subjects like this. So things, I don't know how to, I don't wanna put a number on it, but you know, 100 meters and more beyond, generally you don't have to worry about it. Now, it's just not going to be possible in a single shot to get something extremely close up and at infinity, all in focus at the same time, um, except for the topic we're gonna to talk about next, which is focus stacking, but we're working with one shot technique here. How do we get it right in one shot? So there's gonna be a point at which something is too close to the lens and it's no longer possible. Um, when does it cross over being not possible to being possible? Well, it depends a little bit on the lens and you'll see more about that as we get through this section. So this is gonna work best with wide angle lenses. This is where it's most practical, where you want something that's relatively close like those flags right to the left, there may be a foot, foot and a half away from the camera to things often to the distance to be in focus. And so this is an image you know, where we are using the hyperfocal distance to make sure that we get everything in focus in the photograph. It's very useful, as I say, with landscape photography, very useful when you are shooting vertical so that you can get something right down at your feet or very close in front of you, as well as the distant horizon and items in the uh, horizon in sharp focus. So uh, anytime you have close up subjects and far away subjects, this is when we want to be using the hyperfocal distance. Now let's make sure I'm on the right screen here. All right, so the goal here is acceptably sharp focus from the foreground to the background. And I know what some of you might be thinking right now, hold on, wait a minute. Those are some, those are some catchy words there. What do you mean by acceptably sharp focus? I think we all know that this is a term that may vary from person to person. Well, this is gonna go along with what we normally think is in focus, and it's gonna vary according to all the other factors that depth of field is affected by. The focal length of the lens, the aperture you're shooting at, as well as the circle of confusion. Now, I know we are winding our way deeper and deeper into the weeds here, and you may feel like you are in the circle of confusion right now, but it is a way of measuring sharpness. We need to be able to do this mathematically. And so you don't need to learn this math or memorize it, but there is math behind it, which always makes me a little bit more faithful about uh, something is really going on here. And there is a way to measure and calibrate this. And so if you wanna measure where the hyperfocal distance is, you can figure it out yourself by multiplying the focal length by the focal length, putting that over the aperture of your, you have chosen, and then we need to multiply that by what we consider to be in focus, which is our circle of confusion. So let's talk about the circle of confusion. All right, what is the circle of confusion? It's the maximum size of a projected point of light 
considered to be in focus. And so if you can think about a tiny spot of light out in the universe that you're gonna photograph and it comes through your lens and it gets projected onto your sensor, how big can that be or how small does it need to be to be considered in focus, okay? And remember, you know, when we set a particular aperture opening on our lens, where we focused is gonna be very sharp and then it kind of tapers off. It's, uh, it gets less and less sharp and at a certain point, it's unacceptable and nope, now it's out of focus. And the standard I'll have to admit has gotten a little bit more stringent as we have higher resolution sensors and cameras uh, with greater resolving ability. So let's take a look at the way the light comes through a lens. And so it comes through a lens, it goes through an aperture and it is projected onto our sensor. That, that is our focal point. Now I'm gonna draw the lines beyond this just to uh, show what it would look like if we could move the sensor back and forth. Now the circle of confusion is the size of that spot of light that is focused on your sensor. Now, in theory, we could move the sensor forward and back in this particular instance and still have everything in sharp focus because our circle of confusion is not this infinitely small point. It's a reasonable size dot, you might say, and we can move the sensor back and forth. And we can't really do that, but what we could do is we could move a subject a little bit forward and a little bit back. So if you could imagine focusing on a subject that is 10 feet away, and then they move one inch closer or they move two inches further back. They're still gonna be considered in focus because there's a little bit of wiggle room, you might say. Now, as you stop your aperture down, you get more wiggle room. You can move your subject a foot forward or a foot back. You have a lot more leeway with where that subject is in your composition forward and back and still having it in focus. If we were to look at a sensor with uh, uh, these are very large pixels for illustrative purposes. A spot of light comes into our sensor. Ideally, the spot of light would be the same size as a pixel. It could properly illuminate it and it doesn't have any bleed over. If it's smaller than the pixel, well, as long as it's triggering that pixel and recording that light there, we're okay. Where we start getting into problems is when we have a larger circle of confusion and it starts to bleed over to other pixels and starts affecting them and changing their color and the information that they are recording. If it's bleeding over quite a bit, well, then it's not gonna look very good. And so the smaller the circle of confusion, the more precise you are about sharpness and how everything's going to be. But if you draw it too small, it, it's, it's just not necessary um, for what the application may be. Now, there's a lot of different ways for uh, calibrating and ranking these circles of confusion. But this is generally based on information that unfortunately is over a hundred years old at this point, where the technology was very different than we have today, but it's these standard scales and charts that we have grown up with that haven't really changed for the most part. And this is based off of printing a photograph in an eight by 10 size, viewing it from 10 inches away with a 60 degree angle of view and judging whether the photograph is sharp or not. That is the way the general focus charts have been developed. The focus scales on lenses have been developed. And I don't think I need to be the person to let you know that technology has improved in the last hundred years when it comes to image sharpness in photography. And so I went scouring for information on, well, what is the circle of confusion for various standards? Now, the first one I find is the general one that is used for full frame cameras in determining where the hyperfocal distance is, how do you determine whether an image is sharp? And it's 0 0.03 of a millimeter. You don't need to memorize this number. We're just gonna compare some numbers and some other things and you'll get a feel for where things lay. Now, mobile phones, as we all know, have very small screens, and you do not need an image that is nearly as sharp to look good on one of those. So the circle of confusion for a mobile phone is just 0.1 of a millimeter. It's three times less than a full-frame camera. Full-frame camera needs to have pretty good standards. Well, somebody that has higher standards than regular full-frame cameras is the ASC, the American Society of Cinematographers. So this is the guild that Hollywood works with for filmy movies. 
And while I don't work with them directly, I imagine they have their own focus charts and their own depth of field charts and hyperfocal charts and rankings of lenses. And they have just a little bit tighter standard than us regular folk for full frame cameras. Now, 1.5 crop frame cameras, like all your general Fujis and your crop frame Canons and Sonys and Nikons and what have you, actually have a little bit smaller circle of confusion because their frame is smaller, their pixels are smaller. So you need to have a different circle of confusion if you're calculating things for a crop frame. Next up, and I don't like to throw too many brand names in here, but Fuji does do something kind of interesting. They have a depth of field chart that I'm gonna show you a video example of here in a minute. And they have two different standards that you can go by. You can do the film standard, which is kind of similar to the full frame standard, but adjusted for crop frame sensor and the way Fuji sees the world and what they determine to be in focus. And it's a uh, zero, or 0 0.014. Now, if you were to just print a large poster, six feet by four feet in size, you would need to have a circle of confusion of 0 0.004 to make that look proper. So if you said, well, where does my hyperfocal point need to be for this type of print? Well, you need to know the final use of it if you really wanna figure it out, absolutely. And then finally, Fuji has another pixel standard for their depth of field chart, which is even more exacting if you wanna be very, very precise. And so I'm gonna be showing you some depth of field charts and you can kind of pick and choose where you want to be. And you can choose to be at a little higher standard than the default setting that is already there. It depends on how exacting you wanna be. What do you consider to be in focus versus out of focus? And it's all based on this formula that you can play with to your heart's content. So here is a hyperfocal distance chart. And this is telling you where you need to focus with a particular lens at a particular aperture to have the hyperfocal distance set on your lens. Now, for the most part, we're gonna be dealing with wide angle lenses, stop down a bit so that you can get a lot in focus. And let me just show you what it looks like at f22, where you need to focus and how much is in focus with different lenses. And you'll see why this works well with wide angle lenses. Now I'm gonna show you in red, the focusing point, and then the blue marker is the nearest thing that is in focus all the way up to infinity. So you can see with an ultra wide 11 millimeter lens, stop down to f22, focused at what is that, 20 centimeters in front of the lens, you'll get everything from 10 centimeters to infinity in acceptable focus. Um, and as we move our way out, you can see that this works very well with wide angle lenses. And then as you get up to 50 in the telephotos, uh, this hyperfocal distance doesn't have as many payoff returns, you might say. If you use an 800 millimeter lens and you focus a kilometer away, everything from a half a kilometer to info infinity will be in focus. And so uh, this gets a little bit confusing. And so there's been a lot of simple terms and phrases that have been used in the past. I, uh, I've heard these a lot. I might be actually guilty of, of saying these things a few times. And so some bad advice that you may have heard before is to focus one third into the frame. Now it's not, totally bad advice, it's just not totally right advice. And so what does it mean to focus one third into the frame? Let's look at some examples. Well, in this particular composition, one third up from the bottom, well, that's like the closest thing in the scene. And if I focus there, that's not the hyperfocal distance. Hyperfocal distance is gonna be somewhere between the nearest and the farthest. It's somewhere out on the sand, somewhere in between these rocks in the foreground and the rocks in the background. So that doesn't work out for one third into the scene, nor does this one because the horizon, which is essentially infinity, is one third into the frame like this. Now, this actually does work here in this little bit more normal composition, you might say. If you were to focus at about this one third mark where the red arrows are, then yeah, that's pretty close to where the hyperfocal distance would be for this particular image. So not totally right advice, not totally wrong. It's just, it's 
not the best, okay? Now, some people have switched this out and said one third into the scene. So one third into your composition depth wise is where you should focus, all right? Well, that doesn't always work so well either. Take this composition, all right? So what's the furthest thing into the frame? Well, this mountain that I've measured off at about five miles away. So if we're supposed to focus one third into the scene, well, that's one third of five miles, which means I'm supposed to focus at 1.665 miles away. Check your lenses, folks. They do not have focusing marks for 1.66 miles. All right. What if we want the sun in focus? All right. That's 93 million miles. What's one third? And how do you focus on one third of 93 million miles? I don't know. My lens doesn't have those markings. So this is just not totally right advice. And so this focus extends one third in front and two thirds behind the plane of focus is not totally right advice. Let me show you an example. And I'm going off of standard depth of field charts. You can look these up yourself if you want. Take a 35 millimeter lens, focus to five meters. Focus will extend to two and a half meters in front and to 200 meters in the back. When I run my math on that, that's 1% in front and 99% behind your plane of focus. All right, let's take a 200 millimeter lens, focus on five meters again. This time we're gonna get four millimeters in front and four millimeters behind. So you're getting a 50-50 ratio of what's in focus. And so it can really vary depending on the lens and the focusing distance that you're at. So, when you're focusing on a particular point, you're gonna get something a little in front and a bit more behind it in focus, generally speaking. As you stop your aperture down, you get more in front and more in back, and this continues as you stop your aperture down. When you close it down all the way, it may not reach infinity. And if you notice that infinity is not in focus, the mistake that some people make is to just focus on infinity. And what they've done is they've just wasted a whole lot of in-focus area if they were to move that focus point forward so that the back end of their focus zone hit infinity, they would then be at the hyperfocal distance, the place where they are getting the maximum amount in focus. Now, in order to do this, you're going to have to be like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars and the Death Star. You're going to have to go manual on this one. Uh, this is a very difficult one to autofocus on because there may not be an object for you to focus. It's going to be easier for you to manually focus this. Now, some tools that you might need that will be handy here is a magnifying glass. So if you have a zoom in option, which pretty much all cameras will have, will be very handy. If you're in a, a DSLR system, you're going to want to use live view so that you can magnify on the back of the camera. If you have depth of field preview, that's gonna be a handy feature to have programmed to one of your buttons. It's gonna be very useful in one of our uh, techniques coming up here. Now I've uh, figured out five different ways that you can set the hyperfocal distance. And I'm gonna go through all five. You do not need to use all five. You do not need to memorize all five, um, but I would pay close attention to the last one because I think it's the easiest, but let's just kind of work our way through the problem here. First up, you could just visually estimate it. And I do this from time to time when I feel pretty confident about my estimation abilities. And what you do is you focus on infinity, you focus up close, and you just put the focus somewhere in between. And this can work for subjects that aren't too critical that are a little bit further away. And so you set your lens to manual focus, you focus on infinity, you see where that puts you on the focusing ring, you then focus up close, and then you just kind of put it somewhere between the two. And with a small enough aperture, yeah, you're probably gonna be fine. Once again, this is just an estimate. So we're not doing anything very exacting here. Next up is magnified infinity. So this is where we're gonna magnify and take a close look at our foreground to get it in focus. We're gonna have the lens stop down and we're gonna move our magnification point to infinity. And we're gonna adjust focusing very slowly as we are stopped down on the lens until the background starts to get in focus. And then as soon as it starts to get there, we're gonna stop. So once again, walking through this process, we're gonna magnify in to look at the foreground. 
We're going to focus on the foreground. I'm then going to move the focus box to infinity. I'm going to stop the aperture down by pressing my depth of field preview button. And I see that it's a little out of focus, so I adjust focus just a little bit until it comes in focus. And I know that I have a focus point set that will reach to infinity. All right, so key things is stopping the lens down pretty far, probably f11, 16, or 22. Uh, magnify the distance and then set the focus to the closest distance while keeping the far distant subjects in focus. And so that one might take a little bit of practice on your part. It really helps working with the camera on a tripod so that it's nice and steady in that case. A third way of figuring out the hyperfocal distance is to use this hyperfocal chart. Um, and there's a lot of these that you can look up online. This one, uh, you can download this and look at this. Now, remember these numbers are from a hundred years ago. And so they may not be as accurate as you would like. Let's just take a, for instance, I like the 24 millimeter lens. Uh, let's say a 24 millimeter lens at F16, we would focus at 1.2 meters to get that hyperfocal distance. And now what we might say is, okay, well, we have subjects in there that we want in focus, but you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna stop down to F22 just to make sure we're really covering ourselves so that we're getting a lot in focus. And I know some of you are thinking about diffraction and that is a topic for another time. We're just talking about depth of field. So if you wanted more depth of field, you could just stop down to the next number. All right, another option that works for some people depending on their equipment is scale focusing. Now a lot of a problem that I have with a lot of modern lenses is that they don't have focusing charts on them. And this is where like an old school Leica lens or even some of the more modern lenses will have a focusing scale on them to let you know where you are focused at. Now, the better ones of these will have a hyperfocal scale along the bottom. Some do, some don't. You'll have to take, it your lens, take a look at your lenses to see if they have this. I think Leica lenses do this better than anybody. These are manual focus lenses and a lot of their users use the hyperfocal scale for zone focusing for street photography, for instance. So they have really nice, this is, this is the uh, hallmark of what a good focusing scale looks like. Now, if your lens does have a focusing scale, it might look a little something like this with its depth of field scale down below it. So let's go ahead and focus on 10 feet. If we set an aperture of F11, that means everything from seven feet to 15 feet will be in focus at that focus point with F11. Let's focus on infinity at F11. And we can see we get everything from 30 feet to infinity and beyond infinity in focus. And we've kind of wasted some of our focus here if we're trying to get as much as we can because it's going beyond infinity. Now, another little side note, be aware that many of your lenses will focus beyond infinity. And what that is for, it's for thermal expansion in your lens. It's for when it gets hot and cold and the tolerances are slightly different. And so it's advisable to manually focus your lens on infinity and check it on your scale to see where infinity really is. Is it a little to the left of the line or a little to the right of the line, or maybe it's perfectly right on the line. So be aware of that. Now, if you did wanna use F11 to get the maximum depth of field, this is your hyperfocal point. At F11, it's focused at about 30 feet. It'll get everything from 15 feet to infinity in focus. But if you really wanted the maximum depth of field, you would stop down to F22, focus on about 15 feet, and it would focus would reach from seven feet to infinity as far as what would be in focus. Your hyperfocal distance is then 15 feet. And so what we're doing is we're lining up the hyperfocal mark on the focusing scale with our F22 or our smallest aperture little mark on the bottom scale. Now you can actually see this in some cameras. Fuji has a depth of field scale that I love because it mimics what happens when you focus up closer. It shows you where your focus point is as well as your depth of field, which gets larger as you focus further away and shallower as you focus close. Here's an actual video of me focusing a Fuji camera. And you can see that focusing scale down on the bottom. It grows as we focus out to five meters. If we were to focus out to infinity, we're throwing away half of our in-focus potential area. 
So it would be better to move back to around five meters so that everything from three meters roughly to infinity is in focus. We can focus up very close and you can see very shallow depth of field, especially as we get to our closest region, which is just about 10 centimeters away. If we focus at one meter away and then we start closing our aperture down, we're gonna get more depth of field and that depth of field is gonna extend all the way to infinity. We can move focusing around close up, it gets narrower. When we focus on infinity, of course, it gets bigger. If we focus on infinity, we're throwing away a lot of potential in focus area. If we wanted the hyperfocal distance, we'd focus on about one meter. The in focus area would reach from a half meter all the way to infinity. Now, as you zoom in, we all know that you get shallower depth of field as you zoom in on a lens or use a more telephoto lens. And so you could see that depth of field area reduce there. And once again, as you move that focus point around, it's gonna shrink and grow according to those three different standards, which all affect our depth of field. But a scale like this can really help out in figuring out where is this hyperfocal distance. And it's something that I think we're gonna see on more on more cameras. I think Fuji does it best right now. Some of the new Canon ones have a pretty good one on it. And um, there are some focusing scales on the other cameras, but they aren't showing the depth of field the way this does. All right, here's my favorite way. This is double veneer point. This is the easiest way to figure things out. All right, let's go back to the basics here. So we have something in the foreground we want in focus and something in the background, and we wanna find this mythical hyperfocal point that is somewhere between the two. Well, generally the things in the distance are usually infinity. So we're not gonna to worry too much about that. But this hyperfocal distance is known as the H point and it will have a focus that reaches to the H divided by two point. So focusing on H will yield equal focus on H over two as infinity. So what that means is your close up subject and your distant subject will be of equal focus. They're equally sharp in focus. All right, well, how do we figure this out? Well, we estimate where that near subject is and we double that to figure out our hyperfocal distance. If you recall this chart here, I, granted I rounded off some numbers in here just for simplicity, but let's take the 35 millimeter lens. When you focus at two meters, it's gonna be equally in focus at one meter as it is at infinity. And so stop your lens down to a small aperture and see if it reaches infinity and you will be at the hyperfocal point. All right, so I'll take a subject like this. What's the closest thing to me in the frame? Well, it's obviously this very lower part of the frame, and then I'm going to double that, and that's gonna be where I want to focus. I wanna focus on the flowers in the foreground as the closest element. I'm going to double that distance. Uh, in this case, it's probably two feet to that closest subject and probably four feet to where I was setting the focus point. What's closest in the frame? What's double that distance? And that's where I'm gonna focus. And so this is something that you can do very easily out in the field as you get good at estimating distances. So once again, what you'll do is estimate the near subject. It might be a foot, two feet, three feet in front of you, and then simply double that for your hyperfocal distance. And that's where you're gonna manually set your lens. Now you could autofocus it on that point if there's something to focus on. But as I say, I kind of like doing things old school and just turning that lens manually and getting that point in sharp focus. So then it will extend equally from the foreground to the background. But the final thing is, what aperture do I need to use at that point? Well, this is where you're gonna to have to do some testing. Uh, I will typically shoot two or three different photos to see. I would prefer not to get into the diffraction territory in F22 and 32. So I might try F11 and 16, see if it works out, magnify, the played back images and see if things are as sharp as I like. And then I might try some other settings at F16 or F22. And maybe I'll just shoot it all in the field, bring it home and take a look at it on the larger computer in front of me so I can be a better judge of what's going on. So that double the near point, I think is the easiest one to work with. And it just leaves up in the air. Well, what exact aperture do I need? And with a few different shots, you can cover your bases very easily for that. So there you go, folks. Those are my five solutions on how to find the hyperfocal distance. 
And now I'm gonna check back in to see if everyone has gone to sleep or has questions. Um, there are some questions, John. I've got a whole list of them down here. Um, we'll start with um, the final point that you were just making um, about double the near point. Jean uh, Bardi, I think it is, uh, said higher end Canon film cameras had automated this by using a three step routine where you put the camera on autofocus. And number one is it focuses in the near point, number two focuses on the far point, and then number three is you frame and shoot. Um, I hope this makes sense to you. Um, the camera will set the aperture to cover the distance and shoot. Does this feature exist on newer cameras? No, that feature does not. I am trying to remember the name of that feature um, because it was on their mode dial on the top of the camera. Now, the caveat to that system is that it only worked with items that were in the focusing points that you had in the frame. And as we all know, a lot of DSLRs have focusing points kind of hovered in the middle of the frame. And so it wasn't able to focus on something up there and down in the bottom. It was just looking at the focus points and what was in with them. And so it was, um, it was, it was, it was going to be a problematic mode that was not going to get used unless people really understood the, how it really worked. I think that might be a good system that some company could employ in the future. No camera company does that to my knowledge. Um, working further back about the hyperfocal distance, um, we've got some questions there. Lorraine wants to know, can you trust focus peaking for hyperfocal distance? Focus peaking, that's a good question because focus peaking, what it's showing you is it's showing a shimmering highlight of areas in strong contrast. Things that are in focus generally have strong contrast, but things that are slightly out of focus may also have strong contrast if they just have naturally strong contrast. So it is not to be fully believed, but is a reasonable estimation. Um, and we've got a number of questions, John, on um, the circle of confusion and both with non full frame sensors. So say for instance, the micro four thirds or a 1.5 or 1.6 crop, um, as well as the circle of confusion, how that would be impacted if you had a full frame camera, but you were using a crop factor within that full frame camera. Okay, well, I guess that last part's pretty easy. Whatever your final format is, is where you would have to figure out your circle of confusion for figuring out your depth of field. So if you are cropping, you are essentially using a crop frame camera at that point. Now, the, um, the first part of your question was, um, please restate the first part of it if you could. What would the circle of confusion be for non full frame cameras? Like how would you determine what it is? You, you've got the chart there for the full frame. Right. Uh, well, uh, you could go to a number, there's a number of different websites that deal with depth of field charts online. And they will have additional information there uh, that might talk to medium format cameras. Uh, if you were gonna be using the Olympus well, OM system, uh, micro four thirds system, it's gonna need to be more exacting than the 1.5. If you look at the numbers, you can actually mathematically just kind of figure out what they would be. Uh, they would be double the standard of full frame for micro four thirds. And then they would be a little bit looser for medium format. Uh, but once again, this is designed for eight by 10 print viewed at 10 inches. And your setting might be more exacting or less exacting depending on how your images are gonna get viewed. Uh, this was just kind of an industry standard that has stuck around and we should actually be having higher standards with our high megapixel cameras these days. I think that answers the question um, or the questions. The next one is actually a, a little bit of a more detailed question. It's about the depth of field preview button, but it's on one of your 
um, cameras that you know quite well, which is the X-T3. Uh, Mila wants to know where or how does she identify um, the depth of field preview button on the X-T3? Okay, I'm going off my best memory on this one. I believe the X-T3 normally keeps the aperture open when you are viewing through the lens. And as soon as you press halfway down on the shutter release, it actually stops the aperture down to its working aperture. And you should be able to see that by kind of doing a selfie and looking straight into the lens and press halfway down on the shutter release with a small aperture like F16 or F22. And you'll be able to see whether it's doing it right then and there. And I believe that's the way that Fuji's work. 